<laughs> My name is Norm Jaynes, uh, and I have the pleasure of interviewing the Honorable Raymond R. Norco, or Ray, as we like to call him. Uh, today is the 24th day of July of June, 2013. <clears throat> I'm conducting this interview on the part as a part of the Connecticut Bar Foundation's James W. Cooper Fellows History of Legal Services in Connecticut Project. Uh, so uh, thank you for giving us your time. Um, and why don't we begin, if you can, giving us a brief timeline of your active involvement in legal aid in Connecticut. Uh, basically, I came to back to Connecticut to the Tal and Winder program as a Re Reginald Lever Smith Fellow. Spent a couple of years up in Danielson. Tell us, when was that, right? 1970. Um, spent a couple of years up in Danielson, commuting to Putnam to take uh, clients on Fridays. I uh, had the unique uh, opportunity to serve the clients of the Danielson area. I then went in 1975, uh, was hired as the executive director of the Legal Aid Society of Hartford County. Spent 10 years there, was nominated by uh, the Governor O'Neill to the bench on November 4th, 1985, and been on the bench ever since. It should be noted that I've always kept my eye on legal services as uh, as a judge and tried to help out in any way I could. You might want to mention your role in the Bar Foundation in those years when you, after you were appointed to the bench. Uh, fortunately, I was appointed to the board of the Bar Foundation and, and such a wonderful group of people with determination, uh, grit, and eventually ended up as president. And one of my last official acts as president was the fellows program was voted in at that, at that particular moment which has been, turned out to be a wonderful program, even though we sort of fought our way to the uh, positive side of the ledger. So let's go back to your earliest days in, in legal aid, uh, working with the Tom and Wyndham uh, Legal Assistance Program. Uh, what, what was, um, tell us about the position you held and the kinds of work that you were doing then in the beginning years. Uh, in the beginning years, uh, as any other beginner, I was learning the ropes of uh, poverty. Um, I s sat in Danielson as, a, as the, the uh, leader of the office. So Bob Kelleher was there. Bob left as soon as I came. I don't know if it was because I came, but he left anyway. Um, and then most of the cases I handled that, uh, w w well, we handled everything coming in the door, but most of the merit meritous cases was in the Social Security area, which I concentrated on. Took a case called White v. Matthews all the way to the, state, the United States Supreme Court, in which they failed to grant cert which went through the district court uh, by Judge Clary and the appellate courts uh, down in New York. Tell us about White v. Matthews. What was, the, what was the issue? The ALJs in the Social Security system would hear cases and then sit on the decisions for inordinate periods of time, sometimes as long as 18 months. Basically, I sued saying that if they don't render a decision within six months, they're prematurely eligible until the decisions are rendered. And obviously, if the decision is positive and everything works out well, if the decision is negative, then it cuts them off from the Social Security. Uh, probably said it cost the government uh, quite a bit of sum. It took them about seven years or eight years to reverse that particular decision. And I was always proud of the fact that Judge Clary, who was from the Danielson area, was probably one of the most conservative jurists I've known on the East Coast. And uh, Judge Clary and everything I ever brought never ruled against me, which I've always found as a mark of the distinction. There we go. Um, what, what were the, you were specializing in Social Security disability work, or, or I don't is think that a fair statement? No, I don't think that's a fair statement. You had to take what came in the door, and Social Security seems, disability especially, was one of the areas that was always uh, showing up. Um, I mean, there were people who lived in Danielson and didn't have electricity. Um, the mental illness uh, perspective from the uh, non-governmental was deficient. We were always bringing cases to help people out with mental illnesses and things of that nature. I had one of my favorite clients who's probably long passed away. His name was Jasper McLaughlin, who was a punch drunk ex-fighter. Jasper would show up in my office every day at two o'clock. It didn't matter whether he had an appointment, whether I was there, he would show up and hang around for about 15 to 20 minutes. So finally one day I said, I better figure this out. So I took our, we had a little small bathroom upstairs and I made it Jasper's office. Jasper would go in there, sit on the john for 10 or 15 minutes, do nothing, 
walk out, smile, and come back the next day. <laughs> Can you tell us what drew you to, to legal aid work in the first place, mate? Um, I went to the University of Toledo Law School. I was in the military for four years before I went into went to UConn undergraduate. And in my third year, they opened up a clinic, which was one of the first ones in the country. As soon as I found out what they were doing, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Can you tell us who were, particularly in those early days, but throughout your legal aid career, who were your mentors or who were some of your memorable co colleagues? <laughs> Well, the first one that comes to mind is Doug Crockett. Doug, Doug was always the anchor of the office, intellectually. Um, in, a, in that intellectual shell was a forceful person, a very competitive person that always pushed the buttons the right way and always brought about good results. Um, we had Jack DeZamba, you had Jim Sturdivant, we had yourself, all part of the offices. Uh, the legal aid offices in the 70s was under tremendous pressure from the private bar. I mean, I had an incident myself with the private bar that it, it forced me to go down and take my uh, boards or my license uh, applications through the, the Bridgeport where I lived as a kid. Um, there was a tremendous amount of uh, ill feeling between the private, some members of the private bar and legal services. And of course, uh, Bruce Burwald was the director. And I always used to laugh, and Bruce was a pretty steady Eddie guy, but as director he had a picture of Che Guevara in his office, which I always said that would defend the masses even today. Uh, as I recall, that picture was visible from Main Street as well. So. <laughs> well, Bruce never went out of his way to uh, rub it in. Um, but the office, I mean, the office was filled with people that had a dynamic interest in, in serving poor people. Uh, uniform, even though they didn't, I mean, the competitiveness among the, the attorneys was vicious um, among ourselves. But we always had a docket of about eight to ten federal cases pending in one form or another. And people have to remember, in the 70s, federal court was an open door. You uh, had three judge panels for, for everything that was constitutionally challenging a statute. And that, that got to be such a uh, burden that they formally eliminated that after a while with the three judge panels. Can we go back and, and talk a little bit about the, the reaction of the, the local bar and the judiciary? Uh, can you say a little bit more about the problem that you had? Yeah, I think that the local bar viewed us as uh, interlopers, wise guys, hippies, whatever you, wanted to, whatever you wanted to call us, and that we would interfere with their ability to earn a living. Uh, they were, th that was a major position they took. And I don't want to say it took, it, it, it had a force in how you worked as a legal aid lawyer. Um, you were always conscious of that. The judiciary wasn't exactly, um, famous for uh, opening arms because they always looked at us as what constitutional amendment are we challenging. I always remember the first time I appeared in front of Judge Blumenfeld, that was the first thing he asked me. What constitute another legal aid lawyer? What amendment are you challenging? The first, the fifth, the fourteenth? And then he looked down at the papers and I suited, I suited a uh, doctor and his nurse for t conducting illegal searches at nights in poor people's houses and he almost had a heart attack on the bench. <laughs> But he granted everything I wanted, so I have to always have that as a postscript. Um, it, we wanted to, to get a flavor of what the atmosphere uh, in the legal aid office was in those days. You talked about it a little bit, but is there any more you can say about the the collegiality or lack thereof, uh, the attitude, uh, the, the the feeling of of young legal aid lawyers in those days? They were a very aggressive crew. Um, the first, the first door was not the state courts, the first door was the federal court. And uh, if you did that, you, you obviously had town council, you had big bills coming out of those particular lawsuits, and the citizenry was not happy in a lot of occasions, thought that uh, we were a little uh, aloof and arrogant, uh, which in some cases we were. <laughs> Uh, and, and is there any difference in your mind and your recollection between your experience in Danielson in the early 70s and your experience in Hartford uh, as you got into the uh, later 70s and early 80s? There's been a progression of love towards legal services that has sort of happened underneath my, my watch. I mean, when I was in legal services in Hartford, it, w it wasn't as difficult because it wasn't a close-knit community as such as the Willimannock area was and some of the players. And, there were certain players in the Willimannock and Danielson area that hated legal services with a passion. 
uh, and would do everything to disrupt the ability to practice law by us. When it got into Hartford, it sort of gets fused out because you have such a large geographical area. Um, your funders are different. I mean, remember, I had offices in Enfield. I had an office in Bristol. So I was, I was dealing in multiple jurisdictions at the time. What has amazed me mostly is that the, the change of attitude towards legal services uh, in the past 10 years has been astronomical in my mind. It's almost, I am stunned every time I look at the reception that legal services receives these days compared to what we had to fight through when we were beginning. You've mentioned some of the, the legal issues that you worked on, but, but what, would, what would you say were the major legal issues facing the, the poor, the low-income community when you started? Uh, and then, in, in your experience, what, how they've changed over the period of time when you were involved? Uh, housing was always uh, having enough adequate, adequate income from the social services systems. Uh, welfare was always an issue. No one will call me except someone calls me. Um, Social Security was was a major piece. Uh, income de determinations, welfare, food stamps, things of that nature always took our time. Housing was an enormous, uh, poor people had a very difficult time. Section 8 came in, that, that presented issues. Um, dealing with HUD and the various federal agencies was very difficult. <coughs> Um, so, from all that, are there particular cases or clients or events that stand out for you and in, in, uh, for your from your experience? Um, well, Maggie Klein was the one that was in state out of out of state tuition, which we took to the Supreme Court. So I got a seat to watch uh, Justice Douglas at that particular time, uh, not say a word, and then vote against us, which of course crushed me. Um, but. Uh, Jim Servant brought the case against HUD in which he got a, I think it was a, something like $60 million verdict. I'll never forget, I was in the office of Willimantic when the call came in saying that there's a check for $60 million and no bank would take it over the weekend. <laughs> um, and of course, Jim left the program to distribute those funds throughout the United States. It was a class action that affected everybody in the country. Um, the dockets were so brisk in relation to, we shared a lot of working with each other. We shared a lot of tolerance on each other's issues and ideas. Um, White, White v. Matthews has always been my most favorite because it, it, it basically affected the entire United States and thousands and thousands of people before the government could fight to reverse it. I've always found that as my uh, strongest issue that I, I pr participated in. So, what impact did the um, funding, the source of the funding, or program structure have on your work? Um, you live day to day. I mean, there was a time that we had to sue Governor Meskel uh, to, for him to pay the contract fee to the to the program. Um, when I was in when I was in Hartford, I sued this, the town of Manchester for racial discrimination. I mean, that that was uh, horrible as far as funding concerned. Everybody went after my money instantly. Um, there was a time in when I was at the Legal Aid Society, I represented a Nazi war criminal, uh, Judge Sheldon, who's now the appellate court judge. Sheldon and I represented Bruno Kaminskis. Um, at that point, uh, my, my major funding sources was the United Way, and I can tell you we had trouble with that one also. Um, people tried to punish you through your money, uh, and they could mask their punishment uh, with you know, program determinations, uh, things of that nature. They were very difficult to deal with. Uh, as a director of the Legal Aid Society, I was always chasing money every day. Uh, you never were secure in your funding and the number of people that you could afford to hire and keep, keep working. Do you think that, that those funding issues, did they influence either individual cases that you did or didn't take or uh, priorities in any way? Hopefully not, but probably yes. <laughs> um, so so what's, what was the impact on the rest of your legal career of your experiences working for Legal Aid? Well, when I was at the Legal Aid Society, I was telling Dwight Merriam the government, when Reagan came in, cut, it, cut the community, service, community development block grant money by about 40%, 20% somewhere in there. 
which presented a real problem for Governor O'Neill. And he had two lieutenants, uh, Steve Heinz and Howard Rifkin, that basically adopted a procedure out of the University of Indiana called Strategic Investment Strategy. And basically what that did is through the municipal governments, the state agencies, and the nonprofits all in one room with no rules. I ended up representing the nonprofits, which was about 1,500 nonprofits, and you can't imagine the blood on the floor in that particular issue and we devalue the handicapped versus the blind versus legal services. Where do they all fit financially? Um, it took six months for the first agreement to be worked out. The governor uh, was always appreciative, and uh, his corporate counsel at that time was Jay Jackson, was always appreciative of the effort that uh, the legal services people made to, to, to help solve the problem. And that helped me become a judge, I believe. So if, if you had to say what was the, uh, uh, summarize in, in a few words whether or not or, or how you think you made a difference uh, from your career in legal aid um, and, and what would I guess the other question would be? What would you do differently if you could go back now to the 1970s? And, and uh, um, I hate to tell you this, Norman, but nothing. Nothing. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Um, no, the I you, you don't make it as a legal aid lawyer. You're sort of of, of a crew. You, the crew rows in one direction. If the crew is successful, the crew gets gets uh, that success attributed to them. It takes it takes someone to lead the crew. Uh, meld the crew, work the crew, and result with the crew. And I think that's that's one of the things I learned at Legal Services. It was always an interesting attraction. I mean, when I, when I was a director of the Legal Aid Society, I had 14 lawyers working for me. And I can tell you at times I thought I had 14 babies working for me. Um, very difficult people to deal with because they were very precise in their enunciation and allocution and, and targets. Um, if, if, if you said A in the room, there was, there was probably B, C, D, and E mentioned before the, the A gets uh, sounded as a vowel. Um, very interesting crews to, to work. Um, and they were, they were basically shaped by some of the adversity of the bar and some of the adversity of what they brought. I mean, still today, you still see some lawsuits that you sort of think about and say, well, is that in the best interest of legal services? But that's not the issue, it's in the best interest of the client. Well, um, we're, we've come to the end of, of the, the formal questions, but I'm wondering if there's anything else that you'd like to, to either be remembered for or that you think that others should know about those, the, particularly the very early years of Legal Aid in Connecticut. I think one of the things that helped me in legal services was I joined the Bar Association and worked through the Bar Association. I think that was a, a smart decision on my part because when, when you were sitting beside they couldn't distinguish you from the rest of the population. Um, you were just one of the, one of the guys or girls. Um, I think that's important. I think that uh, what, what legal services has learned to do is participate politically in the process and work with all, all, all players both on both sides of the aisles, both for and against. And I think that's a lesson we, we, we sort of, we fought rather than joined when we were at the beginning and may have paid and perpetuated the, the fighting mode for a little, little longer than it should have been. However, it was, it was, a, it was a crew of people that uh, basically would, would fight first and ask questions later. Um, and it didn't matter. They, they want to represent the client at 100% and that's exactly what they did, regardless of the fallout of the programs. Thank you very much, Ray, for, for taking the time to share these remembrances. Um, again, this is Norm Jaynes. It's on um, the uh, 24th of June, uh, 2013, and we've just finished an interview with uh, Ray Raymond R. Norco, now a Superior Court judge and a longtime uh, legal aid lawyer and supporter of legal aid in Connecticut. And let me just jump in there, Norm. The Bar Foundation, which uh, I've been on the board for like 20 something years, it just got kicked off, which is ironical, um, was one, one source of steady pro-legal services people, very intelligent lawyers, very committed people to society, equality in society. And that, that's a vehicle that stepped in on, on various occasions. I mean, legal services would come in and I was in charge of the grant committee and we used to get into little bouts over how much money to give to them. 
but it turned out that we both watched each other's interests successfully, I think. And I think the Bar Foundation was an important organization that came, came along at the right time with the right people. And your role in it was Didn't equally notice. important? No, 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 not at all. Very important. Absolutely. I did what I had to do. And I think I did what I tried to do what was necessary in order to keep the ship afloat. And well you did. Thank you, sir. Anything you want to add or, or ask, no, Dwight? We can add as an addendum to it, just over your head on the wall. Oh. Point it out and ask them. Just, just tell, pause tell, a little bit here. If, if, say, if right. See, after our interview, it occurred to me that looming in the background okay. was whatever. Right. I want I want people who are viewing this to understand why there's a rat over my head. Right. If you can tell us what that is about. All right. Well, the rat the rat becomes part of the community court process. I should talk I should talk about that a little. And tell maybe, us. Some, yes. I, I think that's an important story. Um, the people in St. Augustine's Church, which is about two miles down the road here. We're very unhappy on the way quality of life offenses were happening and handling in GA 14. So they basically went to New York and looked at Rudy Giuliani's community court there. Like what they saw, came back, interest the mayor, and the mayor was a very positive, that's Mike Peters, a very practical man, came to judicial with $800,000 of weed and seed money, which is ironic how it's called, what it's called, um, and went to judicial and said, we need a community court. Judge, the administrative judge was Aaron Mann. He called me, and originally I said no, uh, because I thought it was too close to legal aid work. And then I went home at night and thought about it, and I thought putting the structure together would be worth the price of admission. And it took me 18 months. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things after we became successful, the city kept on asking me to do different things. And one of the things they wanted me to do is to basically criminally enforce mouse rat infestation and I told him I wouldn't do it I wouldn't do it and we kept they must have asked me 20 times so finally I declared officially that if you find me a rat, a rat with a criminal intent then I'll do it so when I left the court for the first time that's what the little statue with the rat hanging on had the significance of <laughs> thank you you're welcome thank you, thank you.